Good afternoon. I hope you all had a good lunch. So this is the afternoon session of the second day and I'll be speaking on uh, two subjects that's uh, signal processing being the first one followed by instrumentation towards uh, no, noise control and acoustics. Well, uh, to begin with, uh, what do we mean by a signal? We use signals in everyday life. Signal is something which conveys certain information. Okay. And uh, we get a lot of information about the source which produced that signal by processing the signal. Okay. And this is uh, used in all branches of engineering. You call about machinery condition monitoring. We get signals from machine, process them, get to know more about the machine. The doctors look at our ECG, which is kind of a signal, tells us whether how long we are going to survive, right? <laughs> so everybody needs, uh, gets information through a signal, and signal needs to be processed. But coming to noise control, like this morning you all know, how many of this physical acoustical phenomena are related to the frequency at which the things are happening, right? So to find information from a signal as to what are its frequency content is one of the basic signal processing which we'll be learning about this afternoon. Even before signals, you know, if you just, I'm sure those of you who have used an oscilloscope in the laboratory, I get some voltage with just time, some phenomenon. Okay, this is a simple signal to begin with. It, it gives us a lot of information. I could know the mean voltage, I can know the RMS, sorry, RMS voltage, and so on. So this is also a time of, type of signal. Okay, so this is in the, signal is in the time domain. Okay, so there are many ways you can describe signals whether signal is repeating itself, is the pattern of the signal repeating itself, is it a constant signal with time, okay. For example, to begin with, if I plot this signal, some voltage which is coming out of a transducer as a function of time, it could be a constant signal, okay. Uh, the value of the maximum value or mean value in this case happens to be the same or the RMS value. I get some information about this energy in the signal or the amplitude of the signal. But there are signals which vary with time. Okay. So this is a dynamic signal. And the black one is a static signal. Okay, I'll give you an example. What could be a static signal in this sense? Maybe the atmospheric pressure in this room is almost a constant inside this room and that could be a static signal. But if you had a microphone which was measuring my voice level, the way I'm speaking, it could be changing with time. Sometimes I'm not speaking, sometimes I'm speaking. So this is a time varying dynamic signal. So, but then there are a lot of other information conveyed by this signal. For example, what is its amplitude? What is its RMS value? What is the frequency? What are the important frequencies in the signal and so on. So this is why signal processing is important because it relates to the acoustical source which created that signal. And then we can, later on we will see when we apply certain noise control procedures on a phenomena. Some of these procedures are dependent on the frequency as you know perhaps by now. Some of the material properties are functions of frequency. You saw the mass law curve of the transmission loss. They are, no, the transmission loss is never a constant. It varies with frequency, right? Suppose you want to attenuate a source which is having a predominant frequency at 100 hertz, but your material which you have selected has a very poor transmission loss at 100 hertz, but a, a better transmission at maybe 1000 hertz. 
So that would not be a right choice of that material. So that is why signal processing helps us understand the source and then we can put the right measures to control them. Right? So with this basic understanding behind static signal, dynamic signal, what kind of information a signal produces, we will see, we will get to know how we can process the signals. Now, I will briefly recall you to your high school science, maybe your physics. I am sure all of us have done this in the wave motion class. So this is the time period of the signal. So the frequency of the signal f is nothing but 1 by t. So for a pure signal, and this is in fact known as a pure tone, it has a single frequency signal. The inverse of the time period is its frequency. But you will see later on, real world signals which we measure out of machines are not so nice looking. And that is a problem. What are the frequency contents in the signal is what we will find out from signal processing, how I can find it out. Okay. So a few other examples of uh, signal processing which I will uh, show it to you at, towards the end of this class is even earthquake signals. Okay, we, we had an earthquake you know, in Nepal about two years ago. And uh, our uh, my students were measuring in the lab. You know, they I'll, I'll show you the results. They could capture the phenomena, and then we could do a frequency analysis that uh, that signal. Okay. So signals are there. Doctors use the signals to process the internals of a human being, image processing, and so on. So if I was to classify signals, what I had drawn earlier was a continuous signal. That means the signal exists at all time t, however small the time t is. Okay. For, for the intervals of nanoseconds, microseconds, it is a continuous signal as opposed to, so this is an example of a continuous signal. At all time, I have the signal x t. Maybe even I can describe it with a mathematical equation is x t is nothing but a sin omega t as opposed to I only know the values at certain discrete points okay some x i values are, and this is what is a discrete signal I am sure if I asked you to join the red dots you will get back the original white signals but there is a catch there. The red dots need not be far away. Okay, their spacing is very important in something we will discuss later on. But a collection of such sequential red dots is a discrete signal. And those of you who have used Excel or MATLAB, all we do is take an array of Xi and do operations on them. And you can find out mean RMS. So, in some form or the other, we all have done some sort of signal processing in our life already. Right? We find out the mean of an array of numbers, find out the RMS, and so on. But some signals can be continuous and some are periodic, that means they repeat themselves at a definite interval, particularly machines which operate at a constant speed, they will produce periodic signals as opposed to signals which are random in nature. Okay, for example, you know, raindrops falling when you are measuring the noise. Another type of signal which occurs only a fraction of a time is this impact noises which does not repeat. A good example is door slamming the dud noise, something dropping. This only happens for a fraction of a second. And if you had a microphone and you have measured it to look something like this, impulse. So this is again a type of signal 
which needs to be processed. Because you know, I am sure you would have later on we will see many noise control, particularly from a sound quality point of view, many researchers and engineers have worked on what kind of noise is pleasant to your car door shutting or slamming, the dud or a tuck, okay, a classy car, you know, you, you feel the closing of the door, okay. Some other cars you may not like the way the door shuts and the noise it makes. And but this noise is not periodic, it is not continuous, it does not exist for all times. So, you can see signal types themselves are of many, uh, I mean many types, random, periodic, you know, transient or impact and so on. So, we need to find out, as I was telling right in the beginning, what is signal? It is conveying certain information to us. Is it the energy content? Is it the frequency content? What frequencies are present? So, we will see. And if, you are, if it was a pure tone, you can very easily find out the inverse of the time period and find out its frequency. But the problem is, sometimes this signal, we need certain processing to be done. I can do certain analytical processing only if I know the mathematical equation behind that signal. If I give you a signal x t is equal to a sin omega t, okay, and I asked you, if I, if I give you this waveform x t is equal to a sin omega t and asked you to find out the mean RMS, I am sure all of us must have done in our first year circuits course, finding out the crest factor of the signal. But the catch there was, I needed a mathematical expression of this signal, which is not available to me in a real world machinery signals. I possibly do not have an equation to this kind of a signal or this kind of a signal. Okay. So, that is where this analog signal processing only works for a continuous signal, where the signal is known to me in a mathematical form. So, we do what is known as digital signal processing, where instead of the continuous signal x t, we use this signals at every instance i, where i is changing with a delta t. Okay. And today with the availability of fast computers, this digital signal processing is become very fast, very quick and very easy to compute. Large signals can be processed at the pressing of a button. But there are some catches we have to be careful about. So, instead of the continuous red line, I take this signal x i, where and this is in time domain. So, this spacing of how I am picking up this x i is very important and it is given name as sampling. interval. Because as I told you, if you had to work on Excel to even find out mean of an array of numbers, I need to generate those array of numbers x i s. So, that means, I collect them, start collecting them one after the other and keep it in a memory space. And then once the numbers are there, I can do anything that comes to my mind. I am sure MATLAB is a very popular software amongst uh, the engineering students in any university or college. And you know, in the industry, I have seen people are very happy using Excel as well and doing a little bit of uh, signal processing on their own. So, my idea is to get this array of numbers x i. And if you look at this diagram here, so I have an analog input signal which could come from a transducer. Now, we will be talking about the transducers in the next class. Then we have a device known as an a to D converter, that is nothing but an analog to digital converter. So, then output of this is a digital input and this is a digital signal processor. It, it could be your computer, it could be your processing which you do and then maybe you can also, there is a provision, you can also generate an analog signal and, and which is an analog signal which could perhaps be driving a relay and then 
this analog signal maybe could close a valve or open a valve close a solenoid valve and so on so the entire operations of a to d d to a particularly in controls uh, we use this kind of a system but for acoustic purposes or for noise control purposes we are fine once we have the digital signal processing done we get the frequency content in the signal the amplitude of the signal and so on and we will discuss more about the digital signal processing part in the subsequent uh, slides so this data acquisition device is uh, that means it is the values are discretely the data is discretely sampled in time and then because the computers let me give you an example again here suppose i am talking about a 3 bit computer so possibly 2 to the power 3 is 8 so the computer is going to store all these signals only in eight places so to drive that home again so 2 to the power 3 the lowest number is 000 to 111 and then you have 001 and so on you can fill it up so the computer has only eight values into which it can map this varying signals time varying signals right so there's a better slide uh, subsequently down the lectures but then there are two pitfalls one has to be careful about one is inadequate sampling another is inadequate resolution i'll explain you how and why my original signal is this black line i can sample it this zero very closely spaced points and so on and the spacing between them is delta t so what happens if i if i join the red dots or red circles i'll get back my original black signal so this was selected at some sampling interval delta t but instead of that i'll use a different color pen here i picked my first one as a green one here 1 2 3 4 again here okay so in the case of the green one i have a sampling interval delta t star where delta t star is greater than delta t right now if you see if i join the because see once this cross green cross values are stored in my computer computer is going to think that my signal looks like this okay so the original black signal is act by actual signal actual signal because i have sampled at a lower uh, at a larger with a larger sampling interval i am getting this green signal which is a wrong interpretation of the signal so signal looks like a low frequency signal something to do with frequency if your time period is more frequencies are less okay so this signal is said to have aliased into a low frequency signal so one has to be careful that i have <coughs> is you know there's another name for this delta t the inverse of that fs is 1 by delta t which is known as the sampling frequency so today if you went to the market to buy a analog to digital conversion device the first question a person would ask you what is your sampling frequency so this is what you have to define and then that is what you have to decide on so you see if your sampling frequency is poor you will have aliasing frequency alias frequencies but then there is a theorem which says that to prevent aliasing your sampling frequency should be at least greater than 2 times the frequency present maximum frequency present in the signal 
Okay. So always I sample at a frequency twice the maximum frequency present in the signal. So I always ask my students, what if your maximum frequency is not known to you? How do you ensure that uh, signal aliasing is not occurring uh, because of uh, inadequate uh, sampling frequency? So I'll answer that question to you. So I have a transducer on a, this is my machine. I have put an analog transducer. And then I have uh, something here which I am going to ask what it is. And then this is the A to D converter. And then I get my digital signal. So the A to D converter is a bought out item. So I know its specification as FS. Okay. So to prevent aliasing, what we could do is we could put a analog because this side is digital and this side is analog. I could put an analog low pass anti aliasing filter whose cutoff frequency Fc is nothing but Fs by 2. Okay. So, no matter what is your F max, I am sorry, uh, yeah, Fs by 2. So, it is never going to sample a frequency beyond uh, 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 any frequency where this aliasing will occur. I have clipped so, nothing beyond Fs by 2 is actually allowed to come in. So, many of these signal analyzers which are being used for processing dynamic signals have such built in analog low pass filter and as a front end, particularly for noise and vibration signals. Okay. If you talk to the guys who are measuring temperature, they need not worry about it. Okay, because you know temperatures, uh, you know, take time to change. So, if this was temperature, if I measured here, I measured at a longer interval, I would not be introducing any large significant error. So, data acquisition devices for temperatures relatively are cheaper compared to data acquisition devices which are used for analyzing noise and vibration signals or analyzing signals which have a high frequency content. Okay. There are many phenomena in uh, as you know in acoustics we are dealing from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, but there are a lot of phenomena happening beyond 20 kilohertz as in the case of ultrasonics. Okay. And then you know, a lot of these ultrasonics are used for fault detection, for communications, sonars, etc. You know, very high frequency waves, as you'll see, are very directional. Okay, and this helps us in you know, identifying sources, etc. So there, the sampling is also an issue. Acoustic emission is another physical phenomena occurring around somewhere around two megahertz, and so on. It's a very very high frequency phenomena. But if you are looking at NVH signals, you know, we are pretty much in this range and then you know if you would have played with your you know, audio uh, digital processors you know you would have heard of things like 8 time over sample 8 times over sampling 12 times over sampling and so that has got to do with how how much of over sampling you are doing beyond your audible range so for example if a signal needs to be uh, heard till 20 kilohertz i need to at least acquire it at you know 40 kilohertz or more in fact the industry standard is still even still higher okay otherwise if i process a digital signal if i have acquired it at 10 kilohertz and i am trying to reproduce things at 20 kilohertz it makes no sense okay so that is why you will see many of this instrumentation the reason i want to tell you this is you know i have been to many industries where we uh, try to solve noise control, you know, they would have 
stuck in a microphone or a sound level meter and give me some numbers, but the microphone or the sound level meter was never designed to measure at those frequencies or the everything was fine, but then they put in data acquisition device which only sampled till 5 kilohertz and gave me results till 20 kilohertz as an audio spectrum. Those are all not right. So please be careful about selecting the sampling frequency and you can see the effect of aliasing which occurs because of an incorrect sampling, right? And of course, you know, this uh, things you will find in my uh, textbook on machinery condition monitoring also, you know, which you can go to the IIT Noyes website to see the details of that book. And then another issue is the quantization error. You know, I was just coming to that, you know, when I say about, uh, because see, once it is in digital, the computer is going to give it, assign it a digital value. So if it is a 3-bit computer, it could be 8 values, 2 to the power 3 is 8. So I will uh, maybe just plot again, this is a very familiar sine wave. So I will store these values as, you know, at 8 levels. Okay, so what happens? So my sine wave would look something like this and so on. So what happens, I am, you look at this jagged red line. So this is because of in adequate resolution. And I am sure all of you will intuitively say instead of 2 to the power 3, if I, if I had 2 to the power 10, 2 to the power 12, 2 to the power 64. And you know why a 64 bit laptop costs more for this reason and accuracy is more because the amplitude fineness becomes very, very fine. I can store the same value of you know, maybe plus 5 volt to minus 5 volt in large numbers of bit values. So the amplitude resolution is very, very fine. So this is because see, um, I want my original black signal, not this jagged red line. How can I improve that? By making it much, much finer. Okay, that is another important error which people do in uh, data acquisition is this quantization error. So high sampling frequency or sampling frequency where I know that I will never exceed and uh, violate the sampling uh, theorem and then adequate amplitude resolution so that I get a good uh, representation or act exact representation of my original analog signal. Once I have done that, I correctly have an array of numbers of xi onto which I can do my digital signal processing. Uh, this is a uh, figure from my book. So if there are small signal glitches, I would mess them, okay, because my resolution is inadequate. So we need to have finer values. Uh, this was just which I tried to draw and explain to having inadequate sampling. So then I am getting, uh, instead of my original black line, I am getting this dashed black line, which is not correct. So if you go to the market, there are uh, many features of A to D converter and uh, this are there in your notes. So I will not go into them in details right now. Of course, you know, this XI needs to be stored in a some place like a random access memory. Some of these A to D devices have onboard memory or they have a data transfer protocol by which this digital data can be stored onto your memory in your computer and then we, we can access and do your processing. Okay. And nowadays, of course, there are many fast transfer protocols. You know, we used to have, you know, when I was a student, we started with uh, ESA, ISA, but now, you know, you're talking about uh, enough, uh, USBs of high speeds and, of course, another thing which is happening nowadays is everything is wireless, sending signals over the wireless, you know, not hardwired and so on. And, of course, you know, data transfer rates are an issue for transferring large number of data in real time at a fast rate and that's a limitation. Firewire, the Mac guys use 3.2 gigabits per second. 
are very fast and if we still have in the industry some RS2 to 232, 232 kilobits per second, that's mostly for controls, you know, set an on switch or an off switch. GPIB used to be a very popular thing, you know, when, when uh, I was in a Herrick lab, the very first assignment uh, Bob Bernard gave me was to convert uh, HP uh, analyzer to communicate with uh, a PC using GPIB, <laughs> and I did some basic programming on that. <laughs> Okay, uh, now of course you know you can do everything data transfer over the network and so on. Now let me come with, so what we have so far is uh, I know how to pick a set of data accurately because see, uh, unless we have accurate representation of my data, anything I infer would be wrong. So my first, one of the important features, you know, once I have XI, you all know how can you find the mean of this, it's nothing but Okay, so this is a typical example which people do in digital DSP. Okay, you can find out the RMS, etc. Now, another thing is that how do I know the frequency content of the signal? Okay, I can put analog filters where, what is a filter by the way? Something goes in, something comes out. So, output by input should strictly be 1, but these filters, you know, if you play a combination of R and C, you can make these filters. So, filters are of different type, 1 is this one, it has a roll off depending on the poles in the filter. So, this is known as the cutoff filter and this is actually a low pass filter. So, it will allow every signal to pass through the system till a cutoff frequency. The other one is high pass, it will allow everything to pass beyond a certain frequency, this is a high pass filter. Okay. And then I have what is known as a notch filter, I can remove a particular frequency. So, you know, I will write this output out input as 0 dB because you know log of this decibel is nothing to do with acoustic decibel, but log of 1 is 0. So, as you will see the frequency response plots of filters given as this. So, that means I am trying to knock off a particular filter and the uh, particular signal, uh, this is known as a notch filter. Particularly notch filters are used to remove many a times a single frequency power line hum you have this 50 hertz humming noise that can be removed by a notch filter. But I can have a filter wherein I can define an upper a lower limit and a upper limit and then there is a center frequency decided. So, I can tune these filters about their center frequencies and move them or have the signal pass through it and I can set the bandwidth of the filter and this is known as the zero bandwidth the filter. So, such filters are constructed and available. So, I will give you this example here, look at this here. I have a pressure wave, this is a microphone representation of a preamplifier, I have a pressure wave and this is how it looks in the frequency spectrum, right. I have set a filter here. So, it is clipping some of these signals at these low frequencies and beyond the high pass frequencies. And so, my filter has processed and this is the output of my filter that means, it has eliminated these frequencies over here and these frequencies over here and then told you what is their overall value. So, in a sound level meter which you will see there are knobs by which you can slide the filters, you can have an array of uh, filters one by one you can say in certain bands this is the average value or whatever and so on. So, this is one way of knowing the frequency content in a signal. I could make this bandwidth very small, I could make it very wide, I could make it constant, I could make it a constant bandwidth, I could make it a constant percentage, we will come to that later on 
or they could be very very fine like a narrow band filter okay and these are all analog filters but then simultaneously i will see how through digital filtering also we can do the get the same thing and of course nowadays you know because of the advancement in digital signal processing you know uh, we do not have all those big old analog meters doing the filtering but it can be done through digital filtering so an ideal filter this is the 0 db i was talking about the bandwidth is nothing but f2 minus f1 but because of this filter roll off there are certain ripples because nothing is idle here so usually if you look at the, this is the 3 db bandwidth okay and if you go to the uh, settings you can change these center frequencies sometimes there is a relationship between this f2 and f1 if f2 minus f1 is a constant it's a constant bandwidth filter and this bandwidth could be fixed by you could be changed by you could be very fine could be very broad you could have bandwidth as fine as 0.00 0.001 because I'll, i'll tell you the reason why sometimes we require such fine resolutions okay but by the way our human ear cannot distinguish between 0.1 or 1 hertz okay suppose i have i say i let you hear a signal which is at 50 hertz and another signal at 50.1 hertz you would not be able to differentiate that but instrumentation will and the reason i tell you instrument instrumentation will because of the fact many large systems you will see sometimes the frequencies are very very close by you know some panel having a local resonance very close to another local resonances so the frequencies are very sometimes very close by and in those cases i require a fine frequency resolution to understand more about that frequency okay and how that is done through again a digital signal processing process so this is a filter where the bandwidth is constant it is particularly used in linear in vibration analysis and the other one is the octave band filter where the octave octave as you know means twice the frequency so if i have an upper frequency is nothing but twice of fl and the center frequency of this band filter is nothing but the geometric mean of fl times fu okay and if it is this is an octave band if it is an one third octave band they are little more narrower f u is 2 to the power 1 by 3 fl so the entire audio frequency range from 20 to 20 kilohertz i can divide it into such octave bands in fact you will see many of the modern processors also have 1 by nth octave band where f u is 2 to the power 1 by n fl and if you look here in this octave band you know, this is 1 to 4 hertz 63 to 250 hertz 4k to 16k is covered in one frequency band okay and this relates good uh, well to our human hearing in terms of frequency hearing also you no know, we cannot perhaps you know distinguish between you know 17000 hertz and 16000 hertz when you get to hear them okay but Uh, let me try to see if I can generate some sounds. This is a high frequency sound, right? That's a low frequency sound. I cannot quite whistle, but that's a single pure tone frequencies. So our ears can distinguish such frequencies very grossly, but if I am not able to generate a 49 hertz and a 49.1 hertz or a 50 hertz, but our ears cannot distinguish that but of course instruments can and that is why in vibration analysis we have very fine linear frequency analysis but in audio or in noise we can pretty much be happy with this octave band or one third octave bands yeah this is uh, there in your notes we just talk, talking about so the bandwidth is uh, more finer as you increase the index n
So filtering is one way of uh, finding out the frequency content in a signal. Okay, but then there are a few other methods. So this is just to give you a feel of typical sound and their corresponding spectrum. Machinery noise or vibration are very periodic. Impacts occur only once, but if you look at an impact, they generate a lot of frequencies. You know because of the direct delta function, which will come to know later on. I can add up three one third octaves to get an uh, one by one octave. So one third octave is little finer than one octave and so on and I can make them still more finer. So now this is an interesting uh, plot here. The same signal looked at three different formats in the frequency domain. The green one is a fixed narrow band frequency resol resolution. So I can see the fine frequencies present in this green signal. Okay, But again if you look at the one octave filter is this dark dashed brown line here. It has missed the finer happenings in these frequencies and put them as an average value over here. Similarly here, similarly here and so on. So we are missing out the finer details once we go for one by octave. So one third octave is somewhere in between one octave and the narrow band. So the choice is yours. Many regulations, many requirements, uh, regulatory standards mention how I should report my results. Is it one third? Is it uh, one octave? Is it narrow band? Okay. Particularly for machinery diagnostics, we use a very finer narrow band frequency. But for acoustical, one third octave is fine enough, provided we have the other things happening. Uh, known to us as well. Uh, I will uh, skip some of the slides because uh, I have already discussed about them. We will come to another uh, area which uh, Professor uh, Bolton mentioned yesterday regarding this Fourier series. Uh, in fact, you know, a few years ago we had a uh, Nobel laureate, uh, I forget his name, he was visiting our campus, uh, mathematics, uh, professor of mathematics. And he was uh, mentioning to us, I remember, what are the 10 greatest mathematical inventions uh, which has helped engineering? And Fourier series happens to be one of them. Okay. And uh, this is a very favorite uh, topic because I believe anything can be represented by sums of sines and cosines. Okay. And that makes life easier for everybody. You have an input, you know, if you, I'll give you this equation. And those who had a course in elasticity, I have this forcing function Ft. Now, if Ft in was given a something of F naught sin omega t, I'm sure all of you would be able to solve this differential equation and get the response. But if Ft looked something like this as an impulse, how do you solve this equation? The easy way is to solve, represent them as a Fourier series and then you all know the solution to this. A principle of linear superposition would hold true to get the solutions to these equations. So Fourier series that way is very, very powerful because of the fact that anything can be represented as sums of sines and cosines. So the same wave, if you see anything is the pink noise here, it can be represented as sums of different periodic waveforms. And I'm sure all of you in your maths class in your second year, third year level would have done this, that a signal xt can be represented as a sine of sine and cosine and so on. Of course, there are certain conditions which has to uh, uh, satisfy. It has to be integrable, it has to be periodic, you know, it has to exist and so on. But look at these equations here. xt needs to be known to us in a mathematical form. And for the signals I just draw a drew out of a machinery, I do not have a mathematical expression representing them. Rather I have what is known as them in the form of x psi. So for a non-continuous, non-periodic signal, Fourier series can be done through Fourier transform. And this Fourier transform could be 
digitally computed and which is known as discrete Fourier transform DS. Discrete Fourier transform is nothing but a digital representation of the Fourier transform equation DFT. Uh, I will uh, skip some of the slides here. So, a digital representation of this DFT is done and actually uh, in the 60s when computer computational was scarce, this used to take n square complex math operations to perform. Okay? But in a story goes like this in 1964, gentlemen 65, Kule and Take developed this algorithm wherein instead of n square, the, you could do this discrete Fourier transform in n log to the base 2 n operations. Okay. And in those days, computations was very, uh, computational resources were very, very scarce and this uh, uh, was uh, immediately adopted. The story goes like this, as, uh, I may be corrected if I am wrong. These gentlemen were being, uh, they were doing at IBM and then they worked for a while with Westinghouse and I think the company Hewlett Packard finally took them over and started making commercially FFT analyzers because the processing uh, power, computational processing power was very less by this. And this gave birth to what is we know today as the FFT, the fast Fourier transform. Okay. So, this is the digital equivalent of the discrete Fourier uh, transform, I mean uh, of the Fourier transform. And then you will see here some terms are now familiar to you. Delta t is that sampling interval I told you about. Okay. And to represent this, so all I need to do is uh, if I have a signal, now I will only draw the dots because I am talking about digits. So, in each one of them is spaced at the sampling frequency f s as 1 by delta t. So, I will start with n is equal to 1 to maybe n is equal to or small n is equal to n 1 to small n is equal to n minus 1 so on. Okay. So, with n data points. Okay. So, at any given instant the signal x t is nothing but sum the value of n times uh, x sorry x i is nothing but the corresponding n i sorry x i is just a collection of this number when i goes to n to n is equal to 1 to n. Okay. So, this sets of x i I get here and at any x k is nothing but that corresponding n times so so at any value the t is nothing but k or n times delta t sorry yeah okay so i know the time representation of the signal n times delta t n is changing so, at every instance of time I have these values okay. and then I plug it in here and then I will get the time and the frequency and so on. So, once I have this, uh, this is just a comparison of FFT and DFT and nowadays of course, the computations being so quick, it hardly makes a difference whether you are doing DFT or FFT even in your mobile you could perhaps be doing an FFT. And then this is how the FFT's result look, this is a 3 hertz sine wave, 5 hertz cosine wave. If you add them up together, the composite signal looks like this and this is how the signal, uh, the corresponding amplitudes and the frequencies show up in the FFT of that signal. By the way, FFT is a complex number. Okay. So, any signal, if I have a signal X T, and if I do a Fourier transform, I will get an x real in the frequency domain and an x imaginary in the frequency domain. Okay. So, I can find out 
certain properties about the signals like what is known as the auto power spectrum. Sometimes represented as S X X F is nothing but X F times the conjugate of X F. Auto power spectrum is an energy quantity. If you look at this, this is the real quantity. Okay, but if I have two signals X and Y, I can find out their cross spectrum, and that's a complex quantity. And if I have a signal. I will skip some of the slides here. So, if I have a signal, if I have an output and an input, I can find out the transfer function, I can find out the frequency response function, and then the cross spectrum divided by the auto spectrum would give me the transfer function. And as you know, yesterday I had talked about transfer function is a complex quantity, it can have a real imaginary or an amplitude phase way of representing that. Spectrum. Okay, and this is how the frequency FRF is related to the input and the output, and then the uh, input can be related to the output by this expressions here. Okay, and by the way, cross spectrum is a complex quantity. So when we have two signals, there is another term which is the coherence. Okay, how is one related to the other? Particularly when we are doing experimental model analysis, we will see that uh, whether the input or the output which you measured is it because of the input. Sometimes when you do model testing, whether when I do an hammering, am I having producing good inputs which corresponds to the or measured output or something uh, not that? I can look into the coherence functions, and when we go to the lab. When you demonstrate to you experimental model analysis, you will see the influence of cross spectrum or the sparse spectrum and the coherence, particularly in model analysis. Okay. And then we will show you some effects of low, uh, low pass filter, high pass filter, and, and uh, band pass filter. And sometimes, you know, when you look work on signals, you know, looking at the signals, you can say. This is a low frequency signal, this is a high frequency signal. Just by looking at the time spacing. So, you all will develop an eye for that. Looking at an oscilloscope, ah, oh, this is a low frequency signal, time periods are more, this is a high frequency signal, they are close by. Okay, this kind of uh, things will occur to you, and particularly when you go to the site to do any sort of signal analysis, many a times because of the different atmospheres, etc., we cannot do any real serious analysis at site while we are measuring. So, many a times this kind of ideas help. Uh, I will uh, just before I conclude, I will uh, give an example of a real world uh, signal processing uh, which uh, actually my students did. Uh, this earthquake happened uh, somewhere in Kathmandu in uh, April 2015 and uh, I had another video and I, I will show you the fish pond tomorrow at my house. But then uh, we have a fish pond in our house and I was sitting by the pond and then I suddenly saw big waves occurring. Okay. Then uh, I was alarmed that something has got into the tank to eat the fishes. But then it occurred to me, I told my son who was around that why don't you quickly switch on the TV, let us see what is happening. And he opens the TV and there is an announcement, there is a big earthquake which has occurred in Nepal, Kathmandu, it is about 1000 kilometers up north. So, the ground waves did are coming and you know about the big tsunami in Indonesia. Okay. A tsunami occurred sometimes you know 10 years, 10 hours later in coast of Chennai, we had uh, you know, inundation and water coming into the onto the beach. Okay. So, the earthquake waves did travel, but then I had uh, my student Maxim who was working in the underwater tank. And uh, uh, fortunately, hydrophones were in that time, and then he also saw the tank flossing his maximum around. Yeah, so then he hit the record button, okay, and he showed it to me the next day. Then I told, why don't you do an FFT now that we have the signal, and that's what I wanted to do. And uh, if you can see, 
uh, this is the hydrophone here and these are there are some dirt settled on the tank and this marks line up and you know they are closely spaced you know if you could measure them you could also for on or there have some relationship with the frequency okay and this is the actual signal which we measured using the hydrophone uh, you could record for about 200 seconds that's good okay and i think you're sampling at a very high rate about okay and then he did an fft and these are very low frequency signals okay so earthquake signals are very very low frequency signals ground vibrations imagine if this frequencies come and move a building kind of energy comes in and so on and so forth and we will discuss uh, more about this uh, in the instrumentation in the next class okay okay thank you uh we break for photograph is that how it is okay so just check with uh, koshik if it is there we will quickly rush down and then have coffee and then we will come Hello. 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 Yeah. Uh, good afternoon after the tea coffee break and the excellent photo session we all had hopefully we'll put some photos on youtube as well or on facebook uh, i'll now speak on instrumentation uh, we did talk about signal processing in the last session in noise control uh, we need to measure of course what is the sound pressure level it is just not the sound pressure level but then there are other associated quantities like sound intensity level and then uh, what are the ways to do that of course another thing which we need to also briefly discuss is uh, yesterday we mentioned about this structure bone noise path so how is this vibration energy flowing in structures so we need to know how to measure vibrations in machine as well so nvh measurements in brief is what we are going to discuss but again i always tell my students uh, do you believe the data you measured okay and that is the first thing because you know garbage in is garbage out no matter what you do i can produce color plots okay so one has to be careful about it and uh, you know having been used instruments since last 30 years instruments are very dear to us and everything depends on how we measure and more than the instrument it is actually also the cable okay this signal cable everything comes to that uh, cable and I'll, i'll tell you a story actually it's our purchase you know who puts an objection and you know, when i buy a transducer and a you know, transducer costs x euros or x dollars you know x being very large and then when i indent for a cable which is at times sometimes in the case of underwater acoustics the cables are costlier than the transducer okay and uh, sometimes you know the cables because of the low triboelectric noise they have to con- uh, carry in uh, with having high signal to noise ratios the cables are costlier and our purchase guys always ask could you not go to the local market and buy the cables i don't know no <laughs> you do not understand something called frequency response okay so when we are doing dynamic measurements one has to be careful about things like dynamic range frequency response and of course uh, calibration now uh, these are three four different things one has to be very careful about otherwise you know it's, it's good to believe uh, data and uh, i was uh, last week i was in a conference and uh, somebody is mentioning regarding uh, good data and good analysis 
uh, the, the data guy is there, uh, everybody believes him, okay? But the data guy himself knows, you know, does he really believe himself? <laughs> so that is where we want us to be careful about. So what are the different uh, elements of instrumentation? One is the sensing element, and then certain signal conditioning, which we has to, has to be done in terms of amplification, you know, filtration, linearization, etc., and then the format which we present our data in. And of course, different sensing elements are there to measure quantities. You know, earlier days when piezoelectric crystals were not developed, people used to use strain gauge based sensing elements for measuring dynamic pressure, um, acceleration and so on. But now, of course, uh, piezoelectric sensors are very popular for hydrophones, for microphones, for uh, vibration transducer, for force measurements and so on. And uh, we have certain sensing elements which actually produce an analog signal. And in the last class, you saw how this analog signal needs to be converted to, to digital domain so that we can do uh, signal processing and then find out more features about the machinery where this machine was or the, where this transducer was put. And there are certain digital transducers as well, for example, the optical encoders and so on. So, in a measurement chain where we use a transducer, one is this physical quantity and then the sensor and we have a corresponding output. And mechanical engineering, now if you talk about any mechanical parameter which you normally measure, temperature, pressure, strain, noise, vibration, etc. For every such mechanical parameter and of course, the process parameters like flow rate, pressure drops, etc. There are specific transducers. This is not a class on instrumentation per se, but then I will be focusing more into noise and vibration measurements. Okay. So, but then something we must know about these instruments in terms of their static characteristics. What is the difference between accuracy and precision? What is the resolution? sensitivity, range, hysteresis, impedance. I will not, for, for because of lack of time, I would not discuss about all them, all of them in detail. But I am sure when you buy an instrument or do a measurement, one has to be careful about these features. And an accurate and a precise instrument and an accurate instrument and a precise instrument, you all perhaps know the difference. And the same measuring instrument, one which is accurate and precise, costs a lot compared to just being an accurate measurement. You know, we're talking about random error and bias error and stuff like that. I'll not discuss that, but then one has to be aware of how these things could influence your results. But rather, I would focus more on the dynamic characteristics because, see, transducer is also a mechanical element. It has mass, it has stiffness. So, it would also have a natural frequency, okay. By 0 dB, I mean dB voltage. So, obviously, when I measure in this frequency range, I obviously cannot be measuring at these frequencies, beyond these frequencies, because what happens? The output gets amplified because it is close to the resonance of the transducer. So, when you select an instrument, the manufacturers give us what is known as the working or usable frequency range. So, I need to measure only in this. So, if you look up any transducer, its dynamic features you will typically get a this kind of a plot okay and so it tells it tells the maximum limit of frequencies to which you can measure is such and such okay that's something to keep in mind another important feature is the dynamic range by the way our 
human ear is an excellent instrument with a very large dynamic range of the order of 10 to the power 7. So, it is the maximum measurable output to the minimum input. Okay. So, you will see uh, you know, nowadays you know we all listen to digital musics coming out of iTunes or DVDs, but you know these were there when we used to listen to tape cassettes, they did not sound that rich because of the amplitude resolution. Okay, the dynamic range of those instruments were much, much lower compared to the present digital audio devices. Okay. So, that is where the concept of dynamic range comes. But then we from any transducer we have an electrical signal output and the reason why we have such electrical signals is inertia and friction effects are absent. Amplification can be obtained with relative ease and of course, we can record at a distance. Okay, these are the advantages. I, I, I remember an event um, uh, in uh, today in Indian railways, there are places where you know nowadays of course, we have all digital interlocking relays and all, but there are places still the loco driver has to give a mechanical key hand it over to the guardsman. So, with that key only he can change the track and that is the kind of uh, uh, mechanical signaling if you can say of is still being used in the Indian rail railways because they were they would not have done the digital signal uh, signaling in those uh, on those tracks. Okay. But now remotely we can be monitoring things uh, for example, a gas turbine operating in Alaska could be monitored from your mobile phone sitting in this room and that is incidentally happening also. Okay. So, remote monitoring of devices of systems is possible. You must have heard about this airport noise. You know, the first time I saw airport noise being monitored was in uh, Toronto airport. You, know, you can see on a screen uh, uh, level flashing if a uh, uh, flight took off the runway. You know, they had uh, runways installed with permanent uh, monitoring microphones. And of course, in India with this awareness of noise pollution, we are looking into the quality of airport noise. You know, I, I was a member of this national pollution committee and uh, we worked on the DG set noise, and the firecracker noise, uh, automotive noise. Now, we are working on railroad and aircraft uh, noise. So, this uh, uh, monitoring of these is also a uh, way of being because we can see what kind of levels the community is getting exposed to. And of course, just measuring and again remotely transmitting or logging at some location so that later on we can use that data for our analysis. Okay. So, signal measurement, recording, data transmission and storage everything comes uh, in place. So, I will not discuss about bias errors and uh, measurement errors, but I will briefly tell you about this calibration. You know, particularly in acoustics, uh, in, in, in fact, uh, Nishpriya uh, during the break asked me regarding a protocol of sound level measurements. I will discuss that. And then, how do you with confidence say that whatever your sound level meter or I will describe what a sound level meter is. What is the value? Suppose, it says 78 decibels. Is it really 78 decibels or not? So, there are calibrators which needs to be put on the sound level meter. We will discuss in the end of the class that uh, the protocol says right in the beginning of your measurement, you do calibrate. Right at the end of your measurements, you again calibrate. If the calibration factor has changed, you, know, you add or subtract depending on if the calibration has changed, but that is a good way to do it. That is a good practice and that is the recommended protocol as per ISO, ISO measurement standards. But then in your measurement chain, I, I began with this uh, say that I have a good transducer or digital readout, but a very poor cable. It makes no sense. So, in your measurement chain, the lowest of the frequency response of all the instruments used in your measurement chain is actually the frequency response of your measurement. So, always make sure I will give you explain that with an example. 
suppose I have a transducer which measures from say 5 hertz to 5 kilohertz okay, and I have an uh, signal conditioner which is measuring from you know, 10 hertz to 100 kilohertz and then I have a digital readout. But then I have a, this cable whose frequency response is only from 1 to 2 kilohertz. Okay. So, any value which you get here is only good from 5 to 2 kilohertz and that is what. So, any number which you get here because of this effect it has got reduced. Okay. So, though it, this transducer is measuring till 5 kilohertz, this guy can only measure till 2 kilohertz and this guy is in signal condition it is okay, fine. So, your measurement output is from 5 to 2 kilohertz, 5 being here. So, this is what I meant by the frequency response of a measurement chain. So, when you select transducers or combine transducers, you need to look into the manuals and find out what is the frequency response. And you can mix and match from your uh, storage Almira and you can do, but then you have to be careful about these issues. I have been to industries, you know, where uh, people give me numbers. They do not sometimes even know when was this instrument calibrated, what are the units, because they have a going in the shop floor that x value, x value, they are leading with x value, and x plus 20 time to get alarm, but they do not know what is the unit of this x. Okay. So, as an engineer, we need to be careful about these aspects as well. And another thing which happens is this uh, clipping. We ensure that you know, the signals, because you know our data acquisition system also has a dynamic range. If the systems clip, I am distorting the signal. This is my actual signal, but if my measurement floor cannot accommodate such frequencies, I have clipped the signal. So, I am creating an error while measurement. So, that is why those of you who use instruments, there is always an auto ranging function. So, make sure we have the amplifier gains set at the right, right levels, so that clipping does not occur. Okay. So, clipping is to be prevented and that is what is done by auto ranging or you can set the range. And this noise floor is the lowest value which we can measure and uh, uh, there has been instances uh, where uh, we have uh, even in our lab, you know, we have gone down to about you know, 28, 26 decibels in the lab. Okay. But then if your product is uh, producing noise say at 25 decibels, we need to have a noise floor much beyond that, I mean at least 10 dB be, uh, less than the value or the level which you are measuring. So, in other words to state it this way, the background would contaminate the, your noise source if the background is not more than less by 10 dB, I hope you understand what I told. Okay, this is my machine. Making x dB. So, your background noise level should be less than x minus 10 dB. Okay. So, you have to have a quieter place to measure it. Okay. And uh, sometimes in the laboratory, you know, we, ha we have come in the middle of the night and everybody has shut off their air conditioners because the structure bone noise and then we we uh, measure it and, uh, and then you know Kharagpur being a railway junction in the middle of the night a lot of this long distance train comes and they pull the horn <laughs> and then uh, we have to start again. Okay. So, there are, there are issues. Uh, I will now briefly uh, go over some of this uh, pictures you know you, you get to see them in the laboratory when you visit us. Uh, this afternoon. This is a piezoelectric accelerometer, you can get a feel of uh, what their size is. 
this is an in axial accelerometer there is a piezoelectric element inside it this can be mounted on uh, any location by a magnet by tapping a start by putting a uh, washer with a glue and so on and then you put a cable which and this this would generate a charge and this charge needs to be converted to voltage because i cannot store charge so charge has to immediately converted to voltage and then transferred over a system where you could measure record and so on so this is an in axial piezoelectric accelerometer see the accelerometers which are essentially used for vibration measurements come in different sizes and shapes you know this this one is a because as a, as you know vibration is directional and when we measure a vibration we have to also specify the direction in which we are measuring so every transducer has a most sensitive direction uh, this is the size of a 50 paisa coin if you mean what i about 1 inch in diameter and this is an inaxial accelerometer with a top connector this is the side connector and this is a triaxial accelerometer if you can see x y and z written out here so three accelerometers are put at one location so when i fix this to a point where i am measuring the vibration if i take the cable out of here i am measuring the vibration in y direction along in this is in x direction and this is in the plane of the present uh, projection and that is the z direction so this is a triaxial accelerometer and sometimes in brief we call it as a triax and this is a vibration meter and uh, this funny that it looks like a sound level meter because the company sells them uh, the same cabinet in a cost saving they have it's a sound level meter uh, casing but then they have the vibration meter uh, functionality and you can attach the cable and it's a digital vibration meter uh, this is a very old uh, equipment which we have in our lab and it still works it's an analog vibration meter uh, you can see the transducer cable and in those days you know this is not digital we had integrators from measuring acceleration if you integrate the acceleration you get velocity displacement and we have some hold circuits for one second hold you can find out the rms and max and, uh, and in fact this is the first instrument i used in the lab when i was i joined as a a uh, master student okay it's still working it's an analog vibration meter and the company has stopped manufacturing them uh, this is a piezoelectric uh, microphone i will come to this microphones later on this is a, a simple sound level meter and uh, this is perhaps the oldest equipment in my lab 2232 it's very handy and you'll get to see them uh, you can it gives you the value in uh, dba Okay, and I, it's my favorite tool because whenever I go for a quick survey, I just carry it in my suitcase, and then quickly I get a feel of the DBA values. You know, I know the iPhones, etc. Nowadays we have the uh, uh, apps with vibration, uh, sorry, SP sound level meter, but I still find this uh, pretty good because it has a max hold circuit also. Okay, you can pause at the maximum values and it can store it for you. Uh, this is a hydrophone uh, wherein there is a piezoelectric sensing element and uh, this comes with an integral cable and uh, the supplier tells us if you go for a longer cable length, the cable length, length is going to be costlier than your hydrophones. Uh, we, we do some uh, work for the uh, Navy in terms of uh, uh, in signal processing and underwater acoustics. So we were uh, fortunate enough for the Navy to sponsor us and they are costly by the way. Uh, get these hydrophones and uh, you also have underwater accelerometers because when talking about structural vibrations underwater we need to have vibration transducers which could be put underwater as well uh, this is a key phaser you know it's nothing, nothing but a capacitive probe you know or a rather an inductive probe so whenever uh, you have a shaft which is uh, rotating because many a times when you have, uh, you want to characterize noise source, if it is going at a certain rotational speed, and the speed could be changing, or speed could be constant, if I put this probe, and this is actually a key wave. So every rotation, when the key wave comes, this gap changes. So I am going to get a voltage pulse. 
and so on. Okay. So, this voltage spacing within this voltage pulse is the time period and inverse of that is the rotational speed. It is a very cheap way of measuring rotational speed and the beauty of it is if your speeds were changing you would get a trigger. Okay. And then this is, and of course, nowadays of course, we use optical encoders even to see the fluctuation of rotational speed even in one rotation and lot of diagnostics could be done by observing the uh, change in the rotational speed even in one uh, rotation. But uh, in noise control many times I need to know the machinery source noise characteristics which are related to the rotational speed. If you talk about uh, say a blower, blower has in the, there are maybe 40 vanes. So, the vane pass frequency would be 40 times the rotational speed. So, I need to measure the rotational speed. So, we can use this simple key phaser to do that. Of course, uh, we have the optical uh, tacho probe, it is nothing but an optical light. If I put a reflecting tape on a shaft which is rotating, every rotation it is going to bounce off the light and then I will get an optical trigger. Okay. So, optical trigger advantage is it can be far off and then the, the previous key phaser had to be close to the shaft unlike the optical uh, uh, tacho probe. I will uh, skip some of these uh, the Hall effect current sensor to monitor and uh, measure the current being drawn. Thermocouple you all perhaps know that, infrared temperature detector, ultrasonic thickness gauge. Because you know once we uh, particularly when I go to the field to do a lot of consulting in uh, noise and vibration control, it is just not measuring SPL, sometimes measuring temperature, measuring other parameters gives you an insight into solving the problem. Okay. And when they see a professor from IIT, they ask me few more questions, why is our flow rate suddenly reduced? You know, how, what can you know about the thickness? Or what can you tell me about the thickness of the shell? Is it going to last? So, we need to know about little bit of instrumentation and uh, you need to believe your instrument first and you need to know that you are doing it right. Because if you yourself are not convinced, how can you they think that you can convince others? So, and uh, uh, again a very favorite thing during measurement is uh, data recording. If you have uh, been to a ship, you know if you have been close to a propeller shaft of a ship, okay, you there is hardly any space between the propeller shaft, uh, particularly in the naval frigates, okay, there is hardly any space of even for uh, people to walk through. Okay. So, in those places it is really not convenient for anybody to sit down do an in situ analysis. Many times they quickly record the data come off to the captain's cabin or come off to our lab and do the analysis. Okay. So, data recording formats need to be changed. You know. Again you know 30 years back when I was a student we had a cassette tape recorder and then came the BNK spool recorders in a 7005, we still have those that uh, spool tapes, you know. but now uh, we are talking about uh, digital audio recording and of course, now the recordings on a flash drive straight away digital conversion and recording and uh, there is no end to the amount of data you can store and of course, the sampling rate at which you can do the recording, but catch there is real time data transfer is still a challenge. Uh, because you know I always give this uh, example uh, to my students in the classroom. Everything is wireless and mobile and you know, we can send SMS, send emails uh, over the wireless, but why in our uh, classroom the overhead projectors I still need to plug in through a cable and not through uh, Wi-Fi because and then I cannot stream a high speed chase of a movie on a uh, projector. It is just because of the data transfer rates, we cannot transfer such high rates over the wireless. Okay, and that is a challenge I am sure with day by day the data transfer rates are increasing and once that happens uh, everything is going to be wireless. Talk about mines, talk about you know, large steel plants, you would be just sitting in your office and data would be flying into, into your mobile phone and you would be doing your analysis and that is what is going to the way of the future, okay, everything is wireless sensors are smart, sensors will take auto corrective measures, they will be 
making, they will be warning you that you know you are doing a wrong setup or I am wrong. Okay, I always give this example. In uh, India, particularly, we buy things you know in the government agencies at L1, you know, which is the, the bidder with the lowest price. Okay, so I always uh, tell this to my friends: Would you be traveling in a flight if the captain announced everything was bought on an L1 tender? Okay, so uh, so we have to take a call sometimes. Okay. And then uh, coming to this data recording format in terms of what is the lower frequency limit and the upper frequency limits uh, and the dynamic range of the digital recording system is pretty high. Okay? And uh, all of you, of course you uh, youngsters would have all been born in the digital age but you know I, I remember the first time when I heard a, a song playing out of a CD and I, I was looking out of my balcony and uh, trying to find out where this orchestra is playing okay it sounded so rich okay because we are used to the old tapes okay where the dynamic range was so poor because now it's a high dynamic range and we make things so uh, nice to hear uh, this is a very popular uh, dat recorder wherein you can uh, record multiple channel all at the same time and then uh, uh, bring it back to your lab and uh, this is uh, my favorite uh, equipment in the lab okay and uh, Sony has stopped recording uh, manufacturing them and the guys who sold it to us they say you know we would like to take it back I don't know still working it's, and I was only I had a forethought that some days these guys are going to disappear so I had those days bought a lot of empty dat tapes and even today, if I take it to the lab, I have recordings so 20 years ago, I can play it to you and you will get a feel that as if the machine was running in front of you. Okay. And this is analog, I can record for 60 minutes, 20 kilohertz, all eight channels and then play it back and then I do analysis. We, we do a lot of signal processing, so I can pull back my old data and then try my new signal processing algorithms. I need not go back to the field to collect data because data collection and measurement and setup is very expensive and time taking. But archiving them in a good tapes and then converting them to digital domain is a good way to do. Of course, the modern tool, uh, digital recorder. Okay, But one thing about this uh, digital recorder is you, know, you can do multiple channel in such recorders we have an option. It can simultaneously take in voltage, it has a built-in um, anti-aliasing filter, it can take in strain gauges, it can take in optical encoders and then uh, it can run on a battery Okay, and then uh, it can store data and then uh, depending on the available memory you can store depending on sampling rate 20 samples per second, you can store for 30 days you know. but that 20 samples per second is no good for an NVH engineer. Okay, so we, we are talking somewhere around 100 kilo samples or so on and so forth. But this is the most important thing one has to keep in mind: the data rate is number of channels times the acquisition rate and resolution. Okay, so data transfer rate bits per second and at how fast I am converting the digital data to the and this execution rate is how many samples you per second you require. And if a phenomena is occurring at 5 kilohertz, I at least need 10 kilohertz and more being better. So you can go to the market and buy different uh, different data recorders depending on their, this stuff. Uh, I discussed briefly about this uh, while I said yesterday, so I will skip some of the slides now. Uh, the piezoelectric transducer where this piezoelectric element is here, it could be either in a compression mode or a shear mode and then it will get a charge or a, then a converted to a voltage. Uh, this is, if you cut a transducer, this is how it would look like. This is the mass and this is the piezoelectric crystal and if you had gone through the slides yesterday on base excitation, basically I will have a motion here and then the relative displacement of this would be proportional to what kind of charge is being generated on this piezoelectric crystal and this charge could be immediately converted to a charge to voltage converter and then you can transmit it or save it. But nowadays and some many of these accelerometers come in with this 
charge to voltage converter already installed or mounted inside this casing. But the problem with such accelerometers is you do not require a charge to voltage converter only require you as requires a current supply. But because the electronics is inside you cannot subject them to a high temperature at most maybe 250 degrees Celsius. But uh, particularly I will again show you in the lab today we have in our laboratory wherein we can put transducers charge type transducers which can be subjected to 600 degrees Celsius uh, I forget the exact number it is about 582 and those are for continuous, continuous monitoring of aircraft or helicopter gearbox vibrations okay? and they can withstand such high temperature exposures. And uh, eddy current proximity probe for those of you who work with turbines you know because from the relative displacement of the shaft a lot of meaningful information comes and this proximity probes works in the principle of eddy current. So, this gap would change if there is an outer center motion of the shaft and then you could get the uh, measurement of the displacement. A velocity pickup is nothing but an electromagnet basically a seismic transducer works in this principle. And this is what I meant about the uh, frequency operational frequency range of transducers. So, piezoelectric accelerometers have a wide range dynamic range as opposed to a velocity transducer or an eddy current probe and personally thus I like a piezoelectric accelerometer I can measure any form of vibration and then if I want velocity or displacement I can do a digital integration. And this is a typical frequency response curve of an uh, instrument. So, this ISO 2372 standard tells you about uh, vibration measurements and uh, what kind of levels you have to be there, what kind of frequency range. This is a charge amplifier which can take in a charge from a transducer, charge type transducer wherein you can get digital output in terms of uh, either acceleration or even sometimes as force because there are trans force transducers with a piezoelectric crystal inside them. And it, this also has a built in amplifier where you can amplify and send it uh, beyond for transmission. So, this are some, some of the methods to mount the accelerometers a magnetic base, the stud mount or a handheld. Am I going up or down? I am going the other way, sorry. A typical accelerometer comes with a kit like this. It is an accelerometer, the cable, a magnet, beeswax, a connector, few taps for making a tapping for the studs and washers and so on. Uh, this is a very essential tool to keep in your bag if you are doing a lot of remote measurements. This is an in situ handle calibrator wherein this mechanically generates a vibration of 10 meters per second square at 1000 radians per second and yesterday I had given you that numerical. So, what would be the velocity and what would be the displacement RMS amplitude you can find that out. So, many times because once we put an accelerometer and we put some amplifiers where the gains are not known what kind of losses are occurring in the cable, but at a digital output I get some x volt. I know for a fact now that this x volt corresponds to 10 meters per second square. So, I can do my in situ uh, uh, use uh, input of the uh, sensitivity of that equipment uh, that is a handy tool to carry in your suitcase if you are doing any remote measurements. Uh, we do that vibration measurement etcetera. This is an any axial accelerometer being put on a test rig to do a measurement. Uh, this is a reluctance type velocity pickup, an optical encoder, a single point laser vibrometer. Uh, this is a transformer uh, uh, noise uh, which we are measuring. I will tell you about this transformer noise uh, tomorrow when we talk about human hearing and what effect it had and so on. Uh, here you can see a laser vibrometer trying to measure if you see two laser dots it's trying to measure the rotational uh, vibration also. Uh, this requires certain signal conditioning as well. We do a lot of industrial noise and vibration monitoring just to give you a feel of how bad 
and dirty the industry is in terms of the environment where we measure, but then we have to collect the data and bring it to the lab. Uh, when we do measurements in vibration, uh, one has to be also careful, similar to noise uh, levels. There are standards as to how long a human being can hold on to a vibrating structure. Example is a jackhammer, the worker is holding on to a jackhammer or a steering column. I mean imagine uh, I had a case uh, where we had a tractor manufacturer in India. Uh, they were not able to export their uh, tractor uh, to US because of the fact that once they cranked the engine because of the uh, at the idling, the steering wheel was having excessive vibration and which was not appreciated by anybody. Okay? So, they asked me to look into it and then we found out that when the engine is idling, the engine's firing frequency was equal to the resonating frequency of that steering wheel. Okay. So, we did some structural modifications of the steering wheel and shifted the steering wheel's uh, natural frequency away from the engine firing frequency and we avoided the resonance and the tractor company could uh, is selling and making money and give us nothing. Just kidding. Uh, this is a, another <coughs> Uh, example where uh, we she is holding this. You can see uh, there is a transducer which you will get to see in the lab when this handheld power devices they create a lot of vibrations. We can measure that and there are regulatory standards as well. Uh, this is that example of that steering wheel where we did a structural modification and saw the natural frequencies and so on. Uh, this is that tractor wheel while we are doing measurements at their place somewhere up in North India rotational speed measurements. So, I am brushing through some of this photograph just to give you a view. As an NVH engineer, you have to face the situations. Many times SPL, so what? You need to know the speed. You need to know, characterize the source. Okay, when you talk about noise source identification, I need to know as much as I can know about the source as well. Uh, mounting accelerometers at site is a challenge. So, I always do this practice of making prefabricated cubes with taps made for the studs where I can put the accelerometer. All I do is take some crazy glue or quick fix, or not quick fix, a heavy quick and then sticks, stick this block and then I tap on my accelerometer because no, nobody would like me to tap onto their machine. Okay, at most they will allow me to at least put some crazy glue and put these blocks. So, that is what you do. Uh, this is this is the bolt head wherein I have put this block and put this triaxial accelerometer. Uh, there is an ISO vibration level standard which you can refer to, which tells, which relates to the power of the machine and the overall vibration in velocity mode for this, and uh, just to know whether the vibration levels are exceeding beyond a certain level, you can refer to this ISO standard. Okay. And uh, I will not go into the locations how, where to put this measurement uh, stuff, but close to the bearing is a good location to put when you are doing virus and measurements. This is where we are doing roll bearing monitoring in a paper mill. And uh, today of course, if you go to any modern plants, uh, even this have disappeared also. You just get one screen touch panel, you get everything. You know, when I was a kid, when my uncle used to take me to the steel plants, when I went to their control room, I could see big uh, dials, okay, analog meters and the engineers used to come every hour and log into a big registrar. This is the temperature, this is the pressure and those are things of the past. Today, everything is there on your mobile okay, and for, or your laptop. Uh, this is just for the students to get you excited. This is how a billet looks out of a strip mill and a coming out in a steel plant. And this is how the steel uh, billet looks like. You can imagine, you, know, you have to imagine if one roll failed, what would happen to that steel plant? Okay? The bearing failed. 
and then I wanted to show you this. Every modern plant has such GUI controls, where in all the instrumentation with proper data acquisition is put, and if you touch any one of them, you can pull the past data for diagnostics or uh, uh, see whether they are within the levels and so on. And that is what the modern state of the art plant today is. Uh, we did some uh, gas turbine uh, monitoring for the Navy people. Now I will, uh, before I conclude my talk on instrumentation, I will focus now on acoustic instrumentation that is essentially microphones. So microphones, if you go to the laboratory, uh, it comes in various features, specs, types and so on. You had the old carbon granule microphones, the uh, electric resistance microphones or even the capacitor condenser microphones and now of course the piezoelectric uh, microphones and you would have seen the microphones are also, some microphones are very directional, some are omnidirectional, you know we have you know, uh, many different types of microphones and it depends on what kind of frequency range we are measuring. Okay, there are a lot of things happening in the ultrasonic range okay, where even our human hearing does not work. A lot of ultrasonic machining is being done, a lot of measurements at high frequencies are being done. You are talking about sonars, okay, you are talking about uh, acoustic emission. Of course, acoustic emission is different than noise control. But then Acoustic emission occurs at a phenomena of around 1 megahertz. You now we are talking about very, very low frequency with respect to acoustic emission, talking about in the audible range 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So microphones depending on the price, reliability, etc., and studio microphones and so on. Microphones come in different sizes. The size of the microphone cartridge, 1 inch to about 1 8 inch. 1 8 inch is a very a uh, narrow probe microphone uh, which we use for measuring engine exhaust, uh, duct acoustics is basically a pressure field uh, microphone. We, we will get to see some of these microphones in the laboratory. And then there are three different types of sound field, the free field, pressure field and random field and the pressure field is essentially inside a duct, the free field as you know we have discussed on free field and random sound coming from all directions. And uh, Microphones basically is like a capacitor. I have one plate and another thin diaphragm over it. So it is this diaphragm onto which a sound pressure wave is incident. And because of this, what happened? This diaphragm is going to deflect and this gap is going to change. So the capacitance of these plates is going to change. So if capacitance and if I have given a pre-polarized voltage, the charge correspondingly would change. And then I would, this is a condenser microphone. But so basically if you have a thick plate and a thin plate spaced at a very close apart distance and you have given a backing voltage, I can get some charge and that can be converted and then I will get a sense of the mechanical pressure wave being incident on such a microphone. But then there are few developments to this microphone is there are nowadays they put some piezoelectric material onto this diaphragm and if they flex they would be strained and there will be a charge and then we will be able to and there you do not require a pre uh, you do not require a uh, base voltage okay these are handy because you do not require a voltage source for these microphones okay. but again the problem is temperature i cannot put those microphones to high temperature otherwise the piezo crystal would get destroyed so in acoustical instrumentation i have two types of microphones the condenser microphone or the capacitor microphone and the piezoelectric type micro microphone. So the large size means I have large area and then sensitivity is 
very very high 50 millivolts per pascal is the typical sensitivity and these are somewhere around 1.2 to 1.4 millivolts per pascal is the sensitivity of an 1 8 inch microphone and if the size reduces the frequency response increases you know, it is like that horse jockey you know if you have been to horse racing you would have seen the jockeys are very short why because you do not want to load your horse and decrease its dynamic response ok. So, a shorter guy has a higher response, but lesser sensitivity. <laughs> so, they come with a different uh, dynamic ranges and then you get to select and if you look into any microphone manufacturers catalog you will see different sets of microphones, uh, sensitivity range uh, and so on. And this is the polarized uh, condenser microphone. So, we give a voltage source and this is this diaphragm. And the pre-polarized one we have we put some material here okay, and this charge is responsible for uh, recording the pressure fluctuation. If you go to a manufacturer if these double lines are there it is basically a pre-polarized microphone. So, never give a voltage source to a pre-polarized microphone it may fry the uh, piezoelectric crystal and subject it to a long time. So, uh, this is a diaphragm ok. I tell my students uh, never to open this uh, protective grid because there is a thin diaphragm which will get exposed and then uh, you may easily damage it ok. Uh, I would not tell the story where I did some damage myself. And then uh, you have to equalize the pressure. Now. So, I was mentioning about equalization of this pressure here, here. otherwise, it would be just a barometer, otherwise, measuring the pressure. Uh, this is that microphone put on a sound level meter. Now, coming to the protocol uh, of sound pressure level measurements using a sound level meter, one of course is the in terms of there are many standards one is you put it on a tripod and usually this is about 1 to 1 1.2 meter from the ground you need to measure the wind speed ambient temperature ambient pressure this is because there are some calibration associated with this and this is put on a tripod from the ground and this is where the SLM is put the sound level meter and you have your microphone and uh, you have to do a calibration of the microphone before measurement to your measurement whatever parameter you measure as PL or equivalent sound etcetera which you are going to discuss tomorrow and then at the end of the measurement you do a calibration. Okay. This is and of course, sometimes even the wind direction. Okay. I will uh, leave this uh, to Dr. Sneha Singh tomorrow who is going to speak on uh, sound quality uh, what this A weighting is and uh, so, I will not discuss much on that right now and similarly on the noise criteria when you talk about room acoustics. Of course, uh, microphones come with uh, sensitivity we need to know what is the open circuit sensitivity of such microphones. Uh, yeah, one thing we should know about if you go to the market there are some class 1 or class 2 sound level meters. and. Uh, Today, even if you go to places like you know, I don't know, Radio Shack is still there in the US, but uh, such places you can buy sound level meters. Uh, we can buy sound level meters in our Indian market for uh, even 5000 rupees, but if I buy one from Denmark, it cost me close to 600,000 rupees. So, there is a price for that accuracy and precision 
and you have to certify some of this classes and then you will see this close tolerances at very high frequencies and that is what is the beauty of it. and many of the ISO standards will specify your microphone or the sound level meter has to be a class 1 or the class 2 type. So, any sound level meter is not good for any measurements. So, in our laboratory we have such precision and instruments. Of course, uh, another thing which I need to tell you about uh, today is uh, in this transducers are today, they have what is known as a transducer electronic data sheet TETS. Okay, it is a chip where the sensitivity, the serial number, frequency response, uh, everything is inbuilt. So, many of the analyzers where you record the data, you do not have to go in and key in the sensitivity. So, if it is a TETS transducer through a communication protocol, this information is already goes into your setup. And so, it becomes very convenient if you have large number of transducers, you do not have to worry cable 1 goes to transducer B and so on, you do not have to worry about that. So, this helps us in the long run. Of course, TEDs are little costier and if you see here, this is a microphone with its pre-amplifier and there is a TEDs uh, chip in here. So, microphones exposed to different sound field, it is a free field, pressure field, grazing incidence in duct acoustics use the pressure field microphones otherwise normally a free field microphone or a random incidence microphone in a diffuse field. So, use of free field microphones, noise survey, jack hammering on the road, transportation noise measurement. So, you can use that, but in enclosed spaces, in ducts here, surface microphones with all pressure field microphones. random incidents in a shop floor room you can do that. There are a few special microphones, uh, array microphones when you talk about Professor Bolton when he talks about acoustical holography, I am sure he will tell us what these array microphones are doing. Binaural headsets of course, we have the hydrophones and so on. Of course, uh, there are few other microphones regarding this intensity microphones basically if you uh, I am running out of time. So, I will quickly go into see intensity is nothing but pressure times velocity if I was to say that. See if I have two microphones close by at a spacing of some delta r. So, this is p 1, this is p 2. I can you know if you know the velocity is proportional to the pressure gradient. So, I can measure P has nothing but the average pressure between these two microphones P 1 plus P 2 and this velocity is uh, nothing but proportional to P 1 minus P 2 by delta R and so on and then few other things. So, if I have two microphones you see the beauty of it, I can measure with proper uh, substitutions the sound intensity coming in a particular direction. So, if having two microphones spaced and of course, you know there is a finite approximation error here in terms of what is the spacing, a larger spacing is good for a low frequency accuracy and so on. And when the frequency increases, I can reduce the spacing etcetera. So, there are spacers available in this intensity probe, where you can change the microphone spacing and then have the allowable frequency range of the sound intensity probe change. But the beauty of it, the sound intensity being a vector, if I, if my sound is coming from this direction as shown, P, if I put my probe this way it is going to get a positive value and if I reverse the probe, you will get a negative sound and that is something you which you will, we will demonstrate to you in the laboratory. And of course, special microphones uh, were for remotely monitoring. And this is a microphone uh, which uh, when I joined uh, IIT Kharagpur in 1996, when I did not have any grant, I could only get two microphones and uh, I, I I remember my professor at the University of Kentucky, Andy Seibert. I don't know if you have seen his probes. He started with these uh, two microphone probes. Of course, you have to do the phase calibration and stuff like that. And then he used it and it is good to do the sound power measurement and so on. But now of course, uh, later on I got some money and now have a real uh, sound intensity probe. Okay, and this is how actually it is uh, calculated this delta r is something you have to be careful about. 
some of the parameters which we measured uh, by sound level meter uh, we'll discuss about them later on and of course we need to have a calibrator which a piston phone type or the acoustic calibrator which gives a known value at 1000 hertz or 124 db at 250 hertz which we need to use these are some of the views of this microphone calibrators and the calibration being done on a sound level meter okay thank you